Hello, welcome. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, welcome to the launch of the Everybody Ensemble by Amy Leach. Um, if you feel like letting us know in the chat where you're tuning in from, that would be great. Um, maybe some of you are neighbors, some of you are tuning in from other places. It's always fun to see where people are coming from. We got someone in Park Slope. Hi, Lauren. You're very close. Great to have you. Just wait another couple of moments. People are filtering in. Welcome, welcome. Oh, cool. Hi, Min um, from Evanston. It's great to have you with us. That's one great thing about the virtual format is being able to welcome people from everywhere. And uh, I'll just get started with my form intro now and people will keep funneling in as needed. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Jean from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event with Amy Leach launching her new book, The Everybody Ensemble. She will be talking with Eula Biss, so you're in for an excellent time. Before we start, I just want to say a huge thanks to Amy, Eula, and the team at Farah, Strauss, and Giroux for making this happen, and to all of you for showing up. Although we're not able to host events and restore spaces, our community of authors and readers is still here, and we're very grateful for your support and the chance to make space for conversation and connection. In our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. They can see that you're here, and there are a couple of different ways you can interact with the authors and with each other throughout tonight's event. The first of which is the chat, some of which, uh, some of which, you, which some of you have already figured out. You can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like one speech balloon. If you have a specific question you'd like to have answered by Amy and or Eula, uh, please post that question in the Q&A module. You can find it by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech balloons. And we'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A module to be answered in the later part of the program. Um, and most importantly, tonight's featured book, The Everybody Ensemble, is available for sale from Greenlight. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. at both our Fulton Street and Flatbush Ave stores, where you can purchase Amy's book and many others on site. Or you can order on greenlightbookstore.com for a quick pickup at the store or for shipping anywhere in the U.S. I'll drop the buy link in the chat. As thanks for attending tonight's virtual event, we're offering 10% off the featured book, so you can enter coupon code GREENLIGHTEVENTS10 into the coupon discount section at checkout for 10% off. If you care about supporting the careers of authors and the ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Our interviewer tonight is Eula Biss. This is the author of four books, including the New York Times bestseller on immunity and inoculation, Notes from No Man's Land, and Having and Being Had, which was published by Riverhead Books in 2020. Her work has appeared in Harper's Magazine, The New York Times, The Believer, and elsewhere, and has been supported by an NEA Literature Fellowship, a Howard Foundation Fellowship, and a Guggenheim Fellowship. She will be speaking with our featured author, Amy Leach. The recipient of a Whiting Award, a Rona Jaffe Foundation Award, and a Pushcart Prize, Amy Leach grew up in Texas, earned her MFA in nonfiction creative writing from the University of Iowa, and currently lives in Montana. Her work has appeared in the Best American Essays, the Best American Science and Nature Writing, and numerous other publications. Leach's new book, The Everybody Ensemble, has been hailed as a playful, rigorous, mind-bending romp through human nature, the natural world, spirituality, and more. These short, wildly inventive essays are filled with praise songs, poetry, ingenious critique, soul-lifting philosophy, music theory, and whimsical but scientific trips into nature. Amy is going to start us off with a reading from the book, and then she'll be talking with Eula and with all of you. Please take it away, Amy and Eula. Thank you, Jean. Thank you to the Greenlight Bookstore for hosting this. Um, thanks to you all for um, coming to stare at your screens for an hour and um, listen to an essay about dragonflies. So I'm going to start by 
reading a truncated version of my essay, O Latitudo, which is my reformulation of the medieval Latin phrase, O Altitudo, which meant, O the height. It was um, a reference to spiritual exaltation. Um, and my version is, O the breadth, O the width. Um, so I'll read um, kind of the beginning and the end of this. <clears throat> o Latitudo. I loved being young, says the chorus in Heracles, written around 420 BC. And to this day, people are still chorusing about how they loved being young. And they insist that someday, young people too will have loved being young. Nobody goes up to old people and says, I loved being old. Or if they do, you can't hear them or see them. I know of a bear who didn't love everything about being young. The bear who his first winter built a den for himself, but it wasn't big enough. So he hibernated all winter with his bottom sticking out. Now platypuses could say to us, I loved being young. Since compared with platypuses, humans are whippersnappers. Platypuses can condescend to us, but we shouldn't condescend to them. If we want to condescend to somebody, we can condescend to petunias. Petunia is a ridiculously young flower having been cultivated in the 19th century. But though she is young and inexperienced, I have seen Petunia rallying after a hailstorm, putting herself back together. And I imagine if the super volcano a little south of here erupted, there would be the insouciant Petunia afterwards shaking the ash off her purple. Sandhill cranes fly up from Arizona to Yellowstone to have their babies on top of the super volcano. Their babies are destination babies. The cranes must know what they're doing because like the dragonflies, sandhill cranes are very old, dating from the Pleistocene. The patience of the sandhill crane is exemplified by that mother sitting on her egg in the blizzard. While the snow piles up to her wings, up to her neck, up to her eyes, her baby bird never even knows it's snowing. The mother bird is patient like Monteverdi who had terrible headaches, but you would never know it from his music. Here's to all you mothers out there sitting on your babies in the snow. Our mother of the world is very old and like a lot of old and wild parents like Abraham Lincoln and God and the parents of Petunia, she is quite permissive. The world is quite permissive. She gives us plenty of latitude, plenty of longitude and endless examples of what is permissible. The bubbly fresh springs give us permission to think bubbly fresh thoughts. The stinky sulfurous pools give us permission to think stinky thoughts. Winter gives us permission to think dark icy thoughts, especially if our dens are not big enough to accommodate our bottoms. The slug gives us permission to be sluggish. The bump on the log gives us permission to be a bump on a log. And the bison gives us permission to go around with sprigs of juniper tangled in our hair. Authorities like coyotes give us permission to possess some bite and authorities like dragonflies entitle us to zoom in place in the presence of great explosivity. Petunia authorizes us to be ridiculously young and the platypus authorizes us to be ridiculously old as well as ridiculously ridiculous. The erupting volcano authorizes you to erupt even if you no are no longer three years old even if you are a million years old. <clears throat> Exploding is legitimate and it can be fun at any age. However, after years of watching Yellowstone not explode, I wonder if containing one super volcanic forces so they bubble up to the surface in mud or watercolors or arpeggios or spumoni or whatever your medium is, might be even more fun than exploding. Maybe even better than ejecting a fiery super plume of lava into the sky and blanketing Montana in ashes three feet deep, better than burning down Wyoming, is containing the volcano. 
and consequently composing a gassy, burpy, muddy ode to joy. Thank you, Amy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to be celebrating this book with you. I need to hold up the cover because it's so lovely. I'm holding it up next to your earlier book, your previous book. Your books, your writing seems to inspire designers to make really nice objects out of your books. <laughs> Both of these are just great objects to hold. Um, and I will remind folks that if you want to get this book, it would be super great to do it through Greenlight. They have a link and a discount here. Um, well, Amy, you're you're not as old as a platypus, <laughs> but, but this book you wrote this book at a different period in your life than you wrote your earlier book. They they have some obvious similarities. Um, you know, they're both books of collections of short essays that are. Um, you know, remarkably unique. They sound like nobody else's essays. They're full of plants and animals and stars mm -hmm. and whimsy and um, and your unique linguistic energy on the page. Um, but there's differences too. And I'm wondering if you could talk about what felt different speaking of age and experience, what was different about writing this book or writing from this place in your life this book is also post children. The earlier book was pre children. So um, you not only wrote the book after having children, but while caring for children. So um, maybe you could even talk about that, how, how having children informs the work or doesn't. Sure, they were a big influence. Um, <laughs> one of the biggest influences. Um, yeah, um, you know, I mean, my first book, there were several things that were that were going on. I had 12 hours at a time to write. I would write for 12 hours at a time straight. Um, and that could include lots of research um, and lots of concentration. <laughs> um, my time was truncated um, with this book. I did not have as much time. In some ways, I feel like it intensified um, my writing a little bit. It certainly cut down on my time for research because um, I remember you and I had this interview a long time ago about research. Mm -hmm. um, and I always actually, uh, for my classes, I always put what you said up on the <laughs> up on the screen for my students, um, just talking about how exhilarated you are by research um and you talk about being sort of dizzy like a child but <laughs> finding out new things um i did do a lot of research still for this book but i feel like i because of the truncation of time um and something else that i was writing more from experience so this essay that i just read was um, kind of a good example of that. I kind of, I, I had a man, I had this manuscript due and I did not have six months to research um, as I did for my moon essay in my first book. And so I have been to Yellowstone a lot now that I moved to Montana. It's only an hour and 15 minutes away. Um, and so I was writing more from experience. And, um, but something else that I think was going on was that with my first book, um, I, felt like I was writing about external things to get away from my programming <laughs> or what I thought might be my programming. So um, without research, I would feel like I would just kind of blurt out um, automatic things, um, my own personal cliches or my own personal programming. Um, and so I, I was relying almost altogether on external information. Um, with this book, I felt like maybe with the first, I mean, with the first book I had kind of ex, um, what, what, what would you say? What's the word when you cast out a demon? <laughs> oh, exercised? <laughs> An exorcism? <laughs> I feel like I had kind of exorcised some of my programming and I'm just talking I'm not talking about anything sinister I'm just mm -hmm. talking about just sort of culturally conventions I would write things in 
if I didn't have research, I would feel like I was just um, reproducing conventions. Mm. And although I couldn't necessarily come up with original ideas, I could recognize them as conventions. And I was not satisfied. Um, <laughs> and so, but anyway, with this book, because of less time and maybe more experience um, mm. and the exorcism, I was writing more from experience. So this was the penultimate essay that I wrote. And the last essay that I, that I wrote was about my Pomeranian because um, he was um, quite an experience and quite a scrambler of conventions. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that was, um, that's kind of one of the developments that I felt was mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. I, I love that answer and I love that insight into how you're using research. It's I, I, one of the things that I love and appreciate about your writing is how unconventional it is it, at every turn. It's in, in the way it sounds, but all, in its sentiments. And so to, it's interesting to know that you're, you're using research to partly mm -hmm. to, um, to stave off convention or to yeah. exercise. Yeah. I like exercising convention like conventions. <laughs> <of human. laughs> exercising the convention. Um, I don't know who it, who, who it got sent into, maybe, um, maybe into one of the stuffed animals. The stuffed animals got the demon of convention um, sent into it. But sorry, I, before, I, I was gonna say, I was talking with one of my students today. We were talking about cliches and that there are not only cliches in phrases and words, but there are cliches of thought too. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that is something worth um, fighting. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Um, you know, my father is a huge fan of your writing. I think I've mentioned this to you. I gave him your first book and it just delighted him so much. He loves it. And um, he's a physician and he told me that what he loves about your writing is that it captures what he has always loved most about science, which is the, the feeling of the joy of discovery. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that does feel very palpable in, in many of your essays, this a feeling of discovery. And, um, and it does seem you know, obvious that some of that would come from researching. And so that that's why research would be so important to you is you know, to be engaged in this joy of discovery. But, I, I can imagine that some of that sense of discovery can also come through being around young children. And I'm just wondering where, where else that comes from other than research. How do you, um, how you, how do you, what's the word I want? Harness this joy of discovery or where do you go looking for it? How do you court it? Sure, I mean, there were, there were ambient babies in the house. The <laughs> <laughs> the whole writing of this book and um talk about scramblers of convention if you want if you really want <laughs> people who aren't programmed there they are I, I made them I made them myself <laughs> and, um, then in turn they were they were greatly influential um um both pre-verbally and then incipiently verbally, um, the joy of discovery. I mean, I would also attribute it to words. <laughs> I mean, just reading the dictionary, I f words are a wonderful influence. In fact, just reading the dictionary, I find all kinds of um, inspiring um, subjects. Like I was reading the dictionary and I found a moth that's called the Vietnamese poodle moth. Um, and I thought that was quite delightful. And then um, you just kind of put some words down on the page and then they kind of start playing together. I really um, attribute, if there's any energy, just the, the words themselves. I mean, I feel like my genre is words. I know you have to, you're supposed to um, categorize yourself and differentiate yourself, but I really think my genre is words. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, another source of sort of the joy of discovery, I would say like is Yellowstone itself. I mean, we go there and it's so vivid and so timeless and you drive toward the Grand Prismatic Spring 
Have you seen pictures of that or have you seen it? I think I've seen pictures, but I've never seen it in person. It's gigantic and rainbowy, but mm. when you're driving across the flatland towards it, the steam itself is rainbowy. Mm. So there are yellow steams and red steams and green steams. Um, <laughs> wow. And um, I loved Chicago, but when I was writing in Chicago, um, I was mostly my subjects as if I were a queen. My subjects were um, mostly far flung, <laughs> um, like beavers. I didn't know any beavers in Chicago. <laughs> um, and there's um, a local beaver. There's a lo uh, there's a beaver up here in Evanston that's been creating havoc. It's oh, tell me about it. Tell me about it. Yes, it's been chewing little young trees on um, Northwestern's campus. And now there's all these tree cages around the trunks of the trees. <laughs> One beaver? I Maybe more, but it's been working. It's been doing a lot of work. And one of the trees, it had enormous ambitions because one of the trees it chewed on was this massive, massive weeping willow that said the trunk was like <laughs> this around and it's just got a, a lot of bites out the side of it. And I thought, Beaver, what was your plan with that giant, you know, weeping willow that's trunk is like four feet across? <laughs> oh, how beautiful and extreme and tenacious and never mind. I was just um. I was I I wasn't there. I wasn't present enough to appreciate the Chicago. I shouldn't beavers. have interrupted you. Though. <laughs> <laughs> just to say there are beavers around here. <laughs> yes. Thank you for the corrective. That's a good corrective. Though when Every someone told me about this beaver, I thought <laughs> they don't know what they're talking about. There's no beaver <laughs> around here. <laughs> Well, I felt like with my first book, I would write about a subject like beavers first, and then I would go and meet them in person. Mm. Like I wrote about beavers. Well, I would go, I would, like I went to the zoo and um, watched, the, watched their little camera, but um, they're nocturnal, so there wasn't much to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then later on, I got invited to go to the Adirondacks and I, I would go at desk and watch the beavers. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, <laughs> did I lose the thread? Maybe, let, let me circle back around to, you know, I think I'm, I'm trying different ways of asking you an impossible question. You know, <laughs> this is a question that, um, that was uh, kind of, uh, suggested by John Bresland, who we went to school with. You and I were at Iowa with John Bresland, and he's in the audience tonight. And he said, ask her where her essays come from. <laughs> um, but maybe, you know, maybe it would, maybe that's an easier question to answer, even if you're just talking about one particular essay you know, where the, the genesis is. And I, I would love to know more about that. Is how, how does an essay or how does a particular essay start for you? Sure, it's a wonderful question. And hi, John, and thank <laughs> you for being in the audience. And it's, it's been a while. <laughs> um, so I think I'm not very good at generalizations except I feel like as I get older, I'm trying more and more for them. Um, and I do think about this question, like where does writing come from? And why do we write? And um, I mean, sometimes I feel like, well, I have nothing else to say. So I'm gonna stop writing for a while. But then I sit back down in the morning <laughs> and keep going. And it's, I have to say, it's mysterious. I don't know why I do that. I mean, there's, I guess, the force of habit. But there's also something else that I can't explain um, that I feel like I have to do. <laughs> and um, to the neglect of much else um, in my life. And, um, and why? I'm not sure. I think I get bored, for one thing if I don't write. Uh, again, back to those conventions. I feel like <laughs> if I don't write, um, then these kind of dishonest thoughts go round and round and round in my mind or worries. Um, and then if I do write, I don't know. I feel like I'm inspired by you and your insistence on precision 
and honesty um, that I, I feel like I can kind of be false in a lot of other ways, areas of my life, but not, in, not when I write. And so it's kind of um, exhilarating, yeah. to be honest, um, and um, exhilarating to think new thoughts, which I just don't do if I don't write, really. Um, mm -hmm. And as for certain essays, I mean, I have to say with this book, it, again, it's kind of mysterious where I where it came from I mean I had slowed down my writing had slowed down for a while and I thought well maybe I should just do other things and then I finally thought well I think it's harder to not write than it is hard to write as hard as it is to write I think it's harder to not write <laughs> so it's just kind of an ex existential thing um and I but I wasn't writing very well and I came down here into this basement I'm in my basement now and I didn't have any really ideas but I just came up with and it's kind of sad but kind of funny I just came up with kind of an arbitrary list of titles um that didn't really mean anything <laughs> <laughs> and um <laughs> I thought I'm I'm gonna pursue those <laughs> I don't know what they are but just like random phrases or words, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write them even though I can't write them, even though I can't write them. There's this Martina McBride song, like I can't remember exactly the lyrics, but it's like build it anyway, do it anyway, sing it anyway. I felt like, well, I can't write, but I'm gonna write anyway. <laughs> so it's this some um, kind of mysterious drive. Um, and then, I mean, I can talk probably more articulately about specific essays. Like um, the first three essays that I wrote for this book were about animals living in extreme circumstances. So there's the moose with, I think it's like 70 pounds of antler weighing him down. It's like an affirmation that weighs him to the ground. He can't go to space like Elon Musk. Um, <laughs> he's extremely attached gravitationally to the earth. Um, there was the mesquite tree who sends its roots like 160 feet down in the desert to find water. And so I'm just thinking about the plight of this tree, which you know, it might be 150 feet down and it still hasn't found water <laughs> and it still keeps going. Um, mm. And I think I found these animals just personally very inspiring mm -hmm. um, for the, the extremity of their lives and their tenacity. Um, and then there was a the little gosling, which my children and I might, well, they were babies at the time we were watching. When, I, when they were babies, I could make them watch a lot of nature shows now they um they don't really put up with that anymore <laughs> but we watched I think it was the David Attenborough program and there were these little barnacle goslings mm. whose parents um lay them in a nest 400 feet up on a cliff in Greenland and to get off the cliff they cannot fly they don't have proper feathers and wings yet. They just have to jump and fall. They just have to fall. <laughs> and a lot of them don't make it. And oh. so I don't know. I just felt, I guess I just was drawn to these creatures in such, such extreme, such extreme lives, such extreme circumstances. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, there's such an amazing menagerie in both of your books. And sometimes there's a menagerie even within an individual sentence. An individual <laughs> sentence will have many different creatures. And it makes me think, when, when I think of you out in the world, I think of you with like a cloud of <laughs> like 
insects and birds and owls and creatures just swarming inside and outside of your head like a halo of of creatures um <laughs> and i do think it's very like it's obvious and palpable in your writing that you, you you like the deep inspiration that you find in the like lives and experiences of of animals of creatures mm -hmm. and and maybe you know something less obvious but that you were just talking about music and this is another thing that I, I, this is one of the other things that you do in your life is make music and you are a musician and that also is somewhat palpable in your writing. And it, I'm wondering if you can talk about that, the, the opening essay to this book that every, and it's the title essay that everybody ensemble um, has, you know, all these creatures gathered together to, in, in a chorus, a, a gigantic chorus of all the earth's creatures and, um, and it's a great image, but it's it also is what many of your essays feel like a, you know, a chorus of creaturely voices. And um, yeah, I'm just wondering if you can talk about music and its place in your writing and how you draw from it and even musicality, you know, in prose on the page. Sure. I mean, the sound um, is very important. It's funny that first essay because I was on this panel about loneliness and I thought, well, I'm not lonely. Um, why? <laughs> but then I thought that um, literally I'm not lonely and um, familially I'm not lonely, but musically I'm lonely. Mm -hmm. As a musician, I want people to play with me. I don't want to play the piano or violin by, by myself. And if I find out you, you play an instrument, I will conscript you. I'm into playing with me. Um, and so it was funny because the host made that connection like, well, in that first essay, you're conscripting everybody in, on earth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all 20 quintillion creatures, all of them to, to make music with you. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's one thought. I, I mean, another thing is, I, I do think it affects my priorities. Um, not, uh, I mean, I was talking about words, I love words, but I think even more than words, like, I think I love music even more than words. <laughs> so um, <laughs> if a word doesn't sound right, I don't care if it means the right thing, then it's not the right word. Um, and so the, the sound can take precedence. Um, do you maybe think over the meaning, maybe, sorry, go ahead. Well, do you think that drives some of your unusual word choice? You, 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 you're, Essays are full of unusual word choice and also, you know, invented words, words that are semi made up or mashups of other words is, is that you, do you have to do that in a way to get the sound that I have to do that. And, yeah. and you were talking about the menageries that are even in one sentence. And I mean, that's the most fun I have, like coming up with original thoughts. Ah, it's such, such labor. <laughs> but you have a sentence where I can make a list and just like mash words together like um 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 um, um. like so today I was writing about um so people call the earth the blue planet but I said it was I think of it as the froggy planet or the chipmunky planet or the planty planet um or the sheepy planet or the shrimpy planet or the loony planet <laughs> so so okay sorry I'll stop but I mean that's how I <laughs> So to get swept away with those um those sound those soundy 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 things um <laughs> and um I mean another thing that I I have been writing about um Box Chacon which is a piece for solo violin it's long and I heard this old 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 ancient man playing it and I was like propelled into the universe. Um, but he also talked about it and he talked about how it's Bach um, painstakingly composed it note by note by note by note, but so as to feel improvisatory. Mm. So I thought that was very inspiring mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that um, I also went I want writing, my writing to feel improvisatory, mm -hmm. but it's not always like off the top of my head. It often <laughs> takes painstaking care with 
every single word, but then, you know, try at least attempting, I don't know if I, I achieve it, but attempting to feel improvisatory. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing he was talking about how, um, so a piece on the solo violin is made up of so much implication. So mm -hmm. in, a, in an orchestra or an organ, say, where you have two hands plus your feet on the pedals, um, you're accompanying yourself really, and you can provide all the chords and the rhythm, um, all the context, all the background for the melody um, and the bass notes and everything. Um, but on the single violin, uh, you only have the melody. And so the music is made up of all these implied notes that the, that the violinist is having to imply all these chords mm -hmm. and rhythm and context, et cetera. Um, and I just love that idea how mm -hmm. like a little, a little bit can imply so much um, mm -hmm. without being spelled out. And I think that is another kind of literary aesthetic um, for me as a writer and a reader. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I have more questions for you than we have time left, but I do want to let people know I will pause to get audience questions um, if there are some, but go ahead and type them into there's a little Q&A box. Um, if you have questions, um, type them in there and, um, and I'll make sure to, to get to those. Um, and in the meantime, I have lots more questions for you, Amy. Um, let's see, I'm trying to choose which one. Well, you know, this is another process question. Um, you have this great moment in, um, in your essay. Um, where did I put my piece of paper? Um, it's the essay where you quote from Hafiz. Um, and he, the lines that you quote from him are, the mule I sit on while I recite starts off in one direction, but then gets drunk and lost in heaven. <laughs> and it, it's this, this great moment where you suggest that Hafiz is also writing about his own process as a writer. Mm -hmm. And it made me think, well, is that also what your process looks like, Amy? Is that, you know, do you start riding your mule in one direction and then something happens to your mule, it gets a little drunk and you go in another direction. Maybe this happens, you know, back and forth, the mule text back and forth through your essays. I think that is the way to heaven. Um, <laughs> getting lost on a drunk mule and <laughs> reciting poetry. <laughs> yes, no, ask, that's what I aspire to is um, getting, getting lost on a drunk mule. <laughs> I mean, again, I guess going back to, I didn't mean for this to be the theme going back to getting away from my conventions yes. I mean I may have a plan for my essay but I think it's much more exciting um if the mule gets lost and drunk <laughs> and mm -hmm. I end up well I mean you know hopefully in heaven but <laughs> somewhere <laughs> somewhere else might be really interesting too, other than my um, proposed destination. Um, and mm -hmm. so like I was talking about those, those um, just arbitrary, arbitrary titles I had written mm -hmm. out. I mean, I think that was what I was hoping for, that a mule would come, a drunken mule would come by and pick me up and take me <laughs> off, <laughs> I mean. I do that was like your that. sign that you were holding out, like mules. I'm available <laughs> here. I have my title. I'm ready. I can recite some poetry. <laughs> um, so I do enjoy being swept away either by words, emotions. I mean, back to music. I think music is so. The priorities of music are so emotional. I get, I get swept away by those sometimes. Um, reality sweeps me away rather than <laughs> my, um, and I think this might happen to you too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. Yes, 
it's reality is often even <laughs> the very small portion of it that I encounter in my everyday life is often <laughs> too much for me. <laughs> I mean, I have an idea of something, but then I, I, I had an I had an idea of what children would be and the real children are so much more interesting than the imagined children or the extrapolated children. And so this is why, okay, so this is one way, reason I love nonfiction because mm -hmm. I just feel like the real world, the real Telsa Zoo, the real children, the real barnacle goslings are so much more interesting mm -hmm. than, um, than anything I could come up with in my, in my own imagination. So. So yeah, I would I would say that um uh, be, 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 uh be, 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 sorry being susceptible um to experience um is one way I try to achieve that um getting lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is just a reminder to the audience to do put your questions in the Q and A or you can put them in the chat too. Either way, um, Amy, I'm not sure you know. If we have talked about this, it's it was probably a long time ago, maybe like, you know, as long as over, you know, 15 years ago, if we've talked about this, but one of the things that makes your essays so unusual in terms of the contemporary landscape of essay is that you're writing, um, you know, what I would call personal essays, meaning, you know, in that they're not formal essays, they're not academic essays. So if like, if the essay is divided into these two major um, divisions, you know, the, the formal or academic essay over here, you're definitely on the other side. Your essays are the informal essay. Um, but unlike many, many writers of the, the informal essay today, you very rarely use the first person. So you make a very light use of the first person, maybe a bit more in this newer book than you did in your first book, but it's still remarkably less um, of a first person presence than most contemporary writers who are writing the informal essay. And I'm, I'm just interested to hear your thoughts on that. And I, I guess, why and how that comes to be in your writing. I have my suspicions knowing you as a person, but I, I, I'm curious about your writerly answer. Sure. I mean, somewhat is just kind of a personal diffidence and like I, I'm more comfortable saying, hey, look at the panda bears. Hey, <laughs> look at the jellyfish. Look, don't look at me. Go look at the, look at the caterpillar. <laughs> um, um, I feel a bit more comfortable um, with the spotlight being on them. And especially if it's my own spotlight, it seems weird to shine my own spotlight on me, except that in this book, I, again, I think I was just um, maybe speaking more from my own experience and then, <laughs> during the pandemic, and this isn't actually part of your question, but um, I did write a totally personal book. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. It was like, I mean, that was another kind of instance of extremity um, driving me, mm -hmm. driving me to do something that I wouldn't normally do, but I felt like I had been suppressing a lot of personal sort of um, exposure or revelation for so long. And mm -hmm. then once I started writing <laughs> about it, it just whooshed out. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I, I can no longer speak as a um, totally impersonal personal writer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is great too. I'm very excited for this next book, which is the more personal book. And, and you know, it, I feel like this is one of the great things. I mean, speaking uh, uh, um, you know, uh, about, you know, seeing your own career unfold is getting mm -hmm. to discover that you have many <laughs> modes, you know, yeah. and that you can, or many registers and, that you, it can show up in different ways on the page. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm excited can, and interested by that. Because I think it, it, 
you know, it was an experiment. I think initially I had put myself a little bit in my essays and then I was experimenting more and more with putting myself behind the curtain. But then I think anything can become a, what would you call it, a, a tick or something mm -hmm. where it's no longer, there's no longer a reason for it. It's just kind of a habit. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. to reach farther, <laughs> mm -hmm. reach farther into literary experience, um, it was interesting and very terrifying to yeah. uh, write, write from my my own my own my own um, literal experience. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, though you know it's interesting this like what the first person does and doesn't disguise. You know, it's mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I think is interesting about your essays that don't use the first person is that they don't. Um, I, I don't feel like the narrator isn't there. You know, th there's actually like quite a bit of your sensibility and your enthusiasms and all these other things, like quite a bit of the narrator is there on the page. And that's part of what makes them feel like personal essays to me. You know, it's, it's the, um, is that the, the narrator is such an important presence um, mm -hmm. and, though the narrator might not refer to herself or her lived experience very much and mm -hmm. might not use the first person, might not even acknowledge her own presence. But, you know, your your sensibility is so dynamic and so um, loud on the page that it's, uh, you know, it's, I feel like there's something instructive there about what the first person does and doesn't do, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's, um, the existence of the first person alone doesn't signal, you know, or the absence of the first person doesn't signal the absence of a, of an individual narrator's presence and personality on the page. Totally. <laughs> and the presence of the narr narrator doesn't necessarily signal the presence of the narrator. So, yes. <laughs> for example, so example, when I did start to try, I started trying out memoir kind of when we were at Iowa, mm -hmm. um, where it was very geared towards memoir. And I did try writing about myself um, directly. And mm -hmm. yet I did not recognize myself mm -hmm. in my own representation. So the facts were there, but it didn't actually feel true. Mm -hmm. It didn't feel mm -hmm. like me and it didn't actually feel like nonfiction. It felt like something contrived and um, kind of depressive. <laughs> so, That's so interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and it reminds me, oh, you do have a question here. So I'm gonna get to the question, but it just, it reminds me of, um, you know, years ago I saw somebody writing about uh, Joan Didion. It was right before maybe a biography or something came out and, and the, the critical writer was saying something like, why do we need a biography of Joan Didion? She's already mm -hmm. told us everything about herself. Mm -hmm. And I was like, really? What do you think you know about Joan Didion? Cause mm -hmm. she does use the first person a lot, but I don't think we know that much about her. Mm -hmm. I think that that's an illusion. And anything you think you know, I would double check with yourself cause. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Jenna Johnson is asking, with reference to the narrator and her presence, I'm curious to hear about Amy's relationship with Emerson's transparent eyeball. Oh, <laughs> oh, what a wonderful question. Can I just, um, we, uh, oh, what a wonderful question. I mean, so, okay. So I, I'm a little blurry on the transcendent eyeball, but is that sort of signaling this total object objectivity that that you um are being transparent that you aren't coloring what you see are you asking jenna <laughs> <laughs> are you asking me <laughs> or anybody <laughs> You're alone in answering this question, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> this is <laughs> this is your transparent eyeball to deal with. <laughs> I love Emerson so much, and I forgot his transparent eyeball. Um, I 
he, he's a huge influence on me. Um, if I can refer to, is there, sorry, it's about absorption rather mm. than reflection, taking in nature. Uh, this is what Jenna says. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, taking in nature. Personally, sort of emotionally, taking these things in, um, I feel like broadens my experience so much. And if I can refer to another 19th century writer, <laughs> William James, who talks about the varieties of religious experience, I thought that was such a wonderful experiment in um, inhabiting all these different personalities. So there's the gloomy personality and the joyful personality and these all these different um, approaches to religion. Mm. Um, and there's no judgment um, in his book. He kind of celebrates all of them and tries to inhabit, um, inhabit, perhaps absorb um, all of those different ways of being. And I do feel like that has been a huge influence and inspiration for like trying to inhabit the lives of different creatures or mm. trying to, so like in my first book, there are the panda bears who are totally solitary and um, totally specialized in their diet. They only eat celery. And I feel like I am a panda bear. And so I can totally um, absorb and inhabit that experience. Um, but then on the other hand, there were the goats who are totally the opposite. They're totally gregarious. They love to be together all the time. They love to be together and they eat anything on earth. And um, it was very, very fun for me. Um, and maybe this is part of the trying, um, trying to be transparent, trying to um, be a goat <laughs> instead of my usual panda bear personality but to inhabit that gregariousness. And um, I mean, it's just really fun to uh, learn about the world and try to imagine what these different ways of life are and, and totally celebrate them. I feel like it expands me as my sort of, um, if not my own personality, just my understanding um, of the breadth back to latitude, back to, the breadth of experience that there is in the world. Mm. Oh, I love that, Amy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's also a question here in the chat from Greenlight, from maybe from Jean. Um, she asks, uh, why the essay? That is, what in your experience makes the essay useful or limiting or revelatory form? What does the essay do uniquely for us at this moment in our collective experience? Would you like to speak to it? <laughs> you want me to answer that one? <laughs> it, says, it says Amy, comma, Eula. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting. I, I, I will take a stab at it, Amy. And it's interesting to me, you, you know, that you said your genre was words, you know, that you, <laughs> you don't feel necessarily you know, deeply wedded to the essay or nonfiction mm -hmm. as a genre, that there, there's something more expansive about your, your sense of, of what you're doing artistically. And, um, you know, I, I have done some thinking on this question of why the essay, um, because it, it has happened, you know, over our, you and I, over our lifetime, but also over the course of our careers, our practice as essayists, that the essay has become something that people read, <laughs> which it wasn't necessarily, you know, when we started out, it went from something that, you know, other writers read to something that people who aren't writers read and, um, <laughs> <laughs> so it used to live kind of in the same place that poetry lived. Um, and and we, we've witnessed that change. And so it, it, I have done quite a bit of reflecting on what's behind that and why now, why the essay, what, what does the essay offer that we need? And I don't, part of my partial answer to that is I think, you know, the essay's exploratory nature, it's, it's reaching, it's searching, it's, um, it's 
um, the essay is so often driven by the asking of questions. Mm. And I think, um, you know, I've seen various writers um, and in scholars of the essay suggest that in dogmatic times, the, the essay is, is more important it, it, because the essay is by its nature anti-dogma. It's, it, it's kind mm. of allergic to dogma. Mm -hmm. and or resist dogma and so mm -hmm. the more dogmatic the moment or the atmosphere the the conversation the politics of the time the more necessary the essay is in that moment and that's that's something that I would speculate right now you know in that I, I think uh, all times have their dogmas you know but it's there is something very you know maybe particularly dogmatic about our moment and um mm -hmm. and i do think that that's part of why the essay is uh, it feels so um so valuable to readers right now so necessary so it, it, because it's um contradicting something that is a, a kind of stultifying force in our our thought mm -hmm. in our national conversation and in our public thought and it's the essay is keeping things weird and keeping things lively <laughs> and we need that. It, any, any speaking against dogma has me totally, um, totally with you. Um, <laughs> and um, it's funny that you call it anti-dogmatic because I feel like that's why I chose it. I've always sort of expressed it as the essay felt like um, the Wild West and if there are rules or structures, I just don't know them. And um, so may, maybe it's not, I don't, may, I don't necessarily attribute it to the wildness of the essay, but maybe just my ignorance. Because I, I felt like with poetry and fiction that there, I mean, that, and that's mostly what I read is poetry and fiction, but I felt like there were these special rules, special rules that I would never understand. I have no, I cannot register structure in any way, musically, literarily, I have no idea what structure is, um, makes no sense to me. And so I think I chose nonfiction because either it doesn't have rules or I don't know what the rules are. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I actually think it's, you know, so many of us as new writers try to get out of that place where we don't know where the rules are, but it's such a great place to write from. I, I and I, I think for me too, this is why I've gravitated towards the essay is because it seems the least defined of any of the genres that I've come across. Um, yeah. And so you're you know, saying people try to get out of the rulelessness that they try to get into ruliness yeah i mean and i remember having this i remember thinking this way too when i was a student you know i remember thinking will someone just tell me how to do this tell me the <laughs> rules um you know i'm not sure that i had a full intention to follow them but i remember being impatient for like where's the part where we learn the rules you know mm -hmm. where is the part where they tell us how to do this and <laughs> you know <laughs> <laughs> and I was still thinking that into my graduate degree. I was still thinking, like feeling quite impatient with, with coursework and because this was not being revealed, you know? And sometimes now I see students with, you know, experiencing that same impatience, like, yes, yes, yes. All this talk is, is fine and good, but where's the part where you tell us how to do this? <laughs> <laughs> well, I've experienced that in religion too. I mean, I felt like I grew up in a church which taught you the rules how to go to heaven, here are the rules, here's what to follow, and it's all dogmatic. Um, but really, really how you go to heaven is you get on a drunk mule. <laughs> <laughs> and ride off into the sunset. <laughs> and you recite poetry. Oh, <laughs> uh, Amy, that's such a great place to end. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Escape Instructions to Heaven is my <laughs> note to end on indeed. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you both Amy and Eula for this wonderful conversation. It's been so lovely to be a fly on the wall and thank you all for attending tonight. Um, don't forget to buy your copy of, um, of the Everybody Ensemble. I'll post the link in the chat once more. 
Um, thank you all for attending with us tonight and um, we'll hopefully see you soon. Thank you thank very you much. So much. Thank you so much. Be well. <laughs>